I'm Britt Bingold, and you are listening to Season 3 of Learning Unlocked. Educators are the key holders to unlocking learning for students. Today, as always, my goal is to provide you with resources and tools, the keys, to enable and accelerate learning for all students. Thanks for joining me today. Let's get started. Hey, key holders, welcome to episode 24 of Learning Unlocked. Um, obviously, I sound maybe a little different to you today, and I just want to apologize. I do have COVID-19, and so I am recording this with the two ladies that I have on today from home with a different mic and obviously a little bit nasally. Um, so I apologize for that going forward. Today, we are talking about making connections as a learning community, and I have brought on uh two guests that I think are special guests. You've heard them on the podcast before. They are my fellow instructional specialists, Julia Salci and Wendy Peterson. Um, Julia is in her 18th year in education, uh, 14 were in the classroom. What I love about Julia is her love for the art and science of teaching. I've never seen someone be able to take research and pedagogy and spin it very quickly um, and rigorously into an amazing teaching strategy. Um, And then there is Wendy who is I mean, my gosh, the wealth of wisdom that comes from her mouth. She's taught for 26 years before she came into GPS. I think this is her 36th year in education. Um, And she's a fourth generation Arizona teacher. She just gets teachers. Um, So I love watching Julia work on manipulating um, and a strategy. And then I love watching Wendy come in with her wisdom and, and, and pacing it out and helping us to remember where to pause and how the teachers reflect and have um, time for processing. And I think it's just this beautiful um, like PLC that happens. And so today, I think what's exciting is my listeners get to be a fly on the wall in our office of of how we talk. And so this podcast episode is a little bit different because it's part of a series. Um, There are five domains to our instructional framework. They are connect, design, instruct, assess, and reflect. And so over the course of season three and four, we're gonna be diving in as um, a group, as a team, to talk about each of those pieces of our instructional framework from uh, the vantage points of several different things, being a teacher in a classroom, being a teacher trainer, and being a parent and being a grandparent. Um, And so I hope that you enjoy this conversation. Um, It's a little messy. We talk over each other, we laugh, but that's really what it is like to be in our office and be in our our PLC and in our our working space. Obviously, the goal is that you always get to take away something and bring it back to your classroom. And so again, that is my hope for you today. Um, But I hope you enjoy listening and you laugh with us and um, you can hopefully feel our passion uh, that we just are teachers that just want to empower teachers. Hey, key holders. Today I am with my two fabulous colleagues, Julia Salci and Wendy Peterson, and I am so delighted to talk about um, making connections in the learning community um, based on our uh, district's new instructional framework rollout. Um, And so I just wanted to say hi to the ladies. So how are you guys doing? Good morning. Good morning. I think we're doing pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, we've rolled out two of these quickly. We did connect and design uh, back to back, uh, and it's a little bit, a little lull until we get into instruct. Um, But for our listeners that obviously are outside of our district have no idea what we're talking about when we're talking about this instructional framework, uh, let's start with a quick overview of what our district goals are for our new instructional framework rollout. But let's talk about it in terms of both teacher implementation and student impact. Well, I think our instructional framework is an opportunity for our district to put definitions to what good instruction is. And I mean, I don't know that I could say it any more simply than that, Mm -hmm. that the goal is to finally have this consistent definition and understanding of what goes into making quality instruction um, and what that looks like. And so this rollout is an opportunity to take teachers through 
um, what it means to connect, to design, to instruct, to assess, and reflect. Right, and and um, a committee of teachers and administrators and coaches and coordinators um, worked on this and uh, really were able to uh, focus on what we believed was uh, most important. And so this was the year to roll it out to our colleagues in the district. Our goal this year, though, is really just to get people familiar with it so that they know that, one, there is an instructional framework. <laughs> yes. Um, right? I'd like them, you know, by the end of the year to be able to name those five components that Julia just mentioned. Yes. Um, but otherwise, it really is just kind of dipping our toes in the water, thinking about it, getting it on the radar. I do have to say that it is a document that I am 100% behind. And if everybody embraced it, fully understands it, uh, I think it could make a real difference for instruction and then student learning, which ultimately is our goal. Yeah, and I think uh, it's a really good... Uh way that we rolled it out too, just because normally we roll things out. I think Julia was maybe about to say this with a PowerPoint presentation and, and we move on and we don't want this to become something that just uh, doesn't exist in the lives of the teachers. So as we roll it out, we are trying to make trainings, um, the three of us that really do incorporate instruction, like good instruction as we're teaching about the instructional framework. So I think that's a special, different way. What do you guys think? Um, well, and I think too, the idea is that we are ultimately trying to make sure that teachers are having those active learning experiences Yeah. that help with the same thing that we tell teachers to do all the time. If you want students to know something, to understand it, they have to actively be engaged in it. And so when we create these modules, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to actively engage the teachers in these domains. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and, you know, I've, I've even we've had, you know, great success with both and we are already seeing teachers take some of the strategies they even learn in the trainings and put them into practice in their classrooms, which I think is our ultimate goal as a department anyways. So I think that fits perfectly. So our first domain is called Connect. So that's why this um, episode is called Connecting with the community at the learning community as a whole. Um, and our first concept is inclusion of all. And I think my favorite part of this first concept is the idea that teachers will establish consistent high expectations uh, for the recognition of individual student or staff um, identities. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts on this concept? Um, this was my favorite one, just because we talk about high expectations for learning a lot um, of all kids, no matter where they're at. Um, and then um, how do you how do we do this in the classroom as teachers? Well, my first thought is that this is, for some teachers, a real shift in mindset. Um, because for many years, we, we divided students, you know, into groups. Um, in the elementary school, you had the bluebird reading group and the crow reading group. And, and you, you didn't expect as much crow? from the crows. It's true. And so I think we have to move beyond that. And an example that I saw firsthand, not in the Gilbert School District, I want made clear, um, was a, a, a low-income rural district where an elementary school teacher, I think she was third grade at the time, just really believed that her kids could do hard things, that they were up for rigor. And they were these little kids were actually able to verbalize that to me and explain that their teacher knew they could do it. And so, yeah, it was hard, Miss Peterson, but we, we did it and we worked together. And, and then I went, same school, but a, a, an upper grade level class where the kids were doing the most basic things because the teacher said, well, they, don't, they can't really do any more than this. And what a contrast that was. And so that, that, that belief that it doesn't matter who the child is in your classroom, that or child grade has level. the capability of anything yeah. they can learn. And as John Hattie says, know your impact. They are the, um, you know, we are the catalyst for that learning. 
Well, and I think it fits perfectly with the um, research from John Hattie. I don't know the exact number. Perhaps Wendy does. Perhaps you do, Britt. I think that's oh, 1.44. Four, four. Four, four. <gasps> oh, we just tied. But I'm going to look it up right now. Keep talking, okay. Julia. Yeah, so um, the highest thing on, on, on Hattie's um, research or the effect on student learning is teacher estimates of student achievement. What the teacher believes that the student can do. And I think when we talk about connecting with kids, they need to know that you believe wholeheartedly and you're doing everything every day mm -hmm. with the intention and belief that they can right. learn right. and they can learn at high levels and that you're there to support them that mm -hmm. as teachers i i personally feel like that's one of the number one ways that we connect with them is that we believe in what they can do right. yeah it, it, and it is 1.44 so we win the day uh, <laughs> i'm so proud right <laughs> and, and and i I think too, as I work with teachers on this, I say to them, it's not just about waking up in the morning and going, oh, I love kids and they're gonna learn today and then going in and not being prepared or not. It's not, we're gonna hold hands and sing Kumbaya and they will learn. Um, it's, it's so much more than that, but when a teacher believes they can learn and I'm going to enable that learning, then that's where the power comes. And I think yeah. it ties in with credibility, right? Because mm -hmm. when, when you believe that students can achieve at high levels and you indicate that to those students and they see that you've planned your instruction specifically with the belief that you're going to have no child left behind, mm -hmm. you're going to pull them all through this, um, they believe then that you can teach them. And when students believe that you can teach them, students learn. Yeah, and I kind of want to go back to uh, Julia and I taught together for... I don't even know the years. I probably should have added it up. Um, but <laughs> we've taught together for a long time. We taught AP language together um, and, you know, on, on level freshmen together and all different kinds of things. And so we always had our kids up to high standards. But one of the things that I think we did, um, and I know, Wendy, you've done this too, was that idea of immediacy. Like, yes, this is going to be challenging at first. Yes, maybe it's a little scary, uh, but we're going to get you through it. We're going to take you no matter where you're at. And I think immediacy helped with that. We kind of call it sneaky rigor um, is what we call it in our department, where we make these active learning experiences that are highly rigorous. Um, and so they're having this fun and they're like thinking like, I don't know why they think this is cool, Julia, but they're passing envelopes and taking stuff out of it and adding things. Um, they think that's really cool. Um, but <laughs> And it is, but what they're doing is they're they're doing a lot of things that are way highly rigorous, but they're timed on it. So it's a little bit stressful, but we keep them in that zone of concern. And even though they felt like at that first couple rounds, they couldn't do it as they continue the activity, because it is an active learning experiences, their confidence grows. And because we've told them as teachers, no, no, you can do this. You can get through this activity. I... I I, for a while, taught um, low, low, low students who, um, they were really too low to be in a special ed area, and uh, they didn't know why they were specifically put with me, um, but I just set high expectations for them all the time, and they met them because right. we, we didn't, there wasn't a discussion about it, about you know, you're low, or you're, it, it was all about this is what we're here to to do. So um, believing that and communicating that to kids, and again, it's not in a Pollyanna, woohoo, yay, you can do this. Right. I, I do know some teachers who are like, oh, I tell kids that all the time. It, it, it It's more than that. That's part of it, but it's more than that. So. It's like Julia said, it's the planning, it's the right. action, it's the planning, it's it's showing them through your planning and your designing that you have expectations every day. Right. I always used to hate when they would come in and say, are we doing anything today? It's like, oh. <laughs> yes, and it will be challenging and it'll be fun and we're going to smile and learn. All right. How do you guys think that we model this um, or we at least try to model this um, idea of high expectations for all? Um, as instructional specialists? As instructional specialists, um, when we train, we're training teachers and they are our students, essentially. Right. And we set high expectations of what it means to be a teacher. If you look at the instructional framework, 
that that is the definition of high expectations for instruction in Gilbert. Um, and so when we do our trainings, we really model the idea that how we plan with you will take you and pull you through to these, these high expectations, the activities that we have you do, we reflect back and look at how rigorous they were. Mm -hmm. We have high expectations of what they're going to leave our classes, knowing how to do with their own kids. Um, and so I think just in how we plan and instruct within all of our courses um, indicates that. Well, and I, I think too, um, professional development has kind of a bad rap um, in some districts and with some teachers. And part of that is because it, I, I think part of it is, is that it hasn't been rigorous. Come in, I'm gonna talk to you. I have a PowerPoint up and you take some notes and I'll talk. And if there's time, I'll take questions and you're good to go. Whereas we are always modeling pedagogy as we're teaching content. This is what your classroom should look like. Students should be talking to each other. They should be up and moving. Um, there should be some kinesthetic or tactile involvement. And so to me, that shows that, that that's how we have high expectations for teachers. Um, you may think, oh, I don't, I don't need to do that. I can just listen and take notes. Uh, but to be a fully participating in the learning is what we need you to do to learn. And we believe that you can learn. Therefore, that's how we design our trainings. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the first few times we come out anywhere and they think that's what they're going to get. And then it's like, ha, nope. Um, <laughs> we're going to be moving. We're going to be grooving and uh, hang on for the ride. Um, and I think now they know us well enough, the people that have had us come out, um, that they know that's not what they're going to get. And I think they are, are excited about that. I think they know they'll get something. And even if they don't finish um, the activity perfectly, or even if they don't do the activity um, exactly, you know, like how we planned it. Um, let's say, for example, they do a go go mo. We've talked about that. And a give one, get one, move on. And everybody on at their tables got all of them done, but they've only got two. I think we're really good at modeling for teachers how to model, um, you know, it's okay to not always get there with, and that's okay for your students too. They could still participate in that activity. So I think we try to make sure everyone's always included, right? Inclusion of all, mm -hmm. no matter where they're at. We try to meet right. everybody, even teachers, where right. they're at in their learning. Well, and that that is how we connect with right. them yep. and um, and it's really a way to differentiate as well and that, that differentiation for them provides the connection for us with our adult learners but then for teachers with their yes. students which we hope they take back and use right okay so that's the first domain under our connect module of our framework Okay, so the second domain is interpersonal relationships. And with this, we really hit home on the idea of trust. Okay, that sense of belonging in this concept. Okay, because each of our concepts, if you looked at the framework, has a lot. Um, so we try to make sure we kind of zone in as much as we can on, on, on the whole thing, but it is, it is difficult. Um, so this one, we really did zone in on that sense of belonging in order to connect with kids. Um, but those traits of trust are difficult to master in the classroom for many teachers. Um, why is that? Well, I, I think the part of it has to do with sometimes how we view young people. Um, sometimes we think, well, I'll show them respect when they show me respect, or um, I'm the adult, and so I don't have to model integrity or honesty because I'm above them. So in my classroom, building trust was about the fact that I did respect them, that I did uh, talk to them like human beings. My ex-husband once said to me, how do you talk to kids? And I was <laughs> like, mm, just kind of like they're regular human beings. Just like I kind of talk to you, a little, right. just a little louder. And, <laughs> and so it doesn't, it doesn't matter if I'm in a kindergarten classroom or a classroom with advanced seniors. I am treating them with, with respect and with kindness, and I'm modeling integrity. And if I make a mistake, 
I apologize. And I never put them in a situation where they feel um, uh, un unvalued or like I might um, put them in a situation that they can't handle. And that's how that's how trust is built. Or that's how trust was built in, in my classroom. Yeah. Yeah, when I built, in, in building trust with students too, I really tried to show that I was trying to understand their lives. I was trying to understand what it might look like to have a hectic, crazy schedule at home or what it might look like to have responsibilities at home that go outside of what's happening in school. And so I would always talk to kids before we did anything and I would explain the rationale for why we were doing it. And I think they really appreciated that. So I started every activity with the assumption that they weren't going to, I hate the word buy in, but they weren't going to essentially buy in unless I really made it clear how and, and why, um, how they were going to get there and why we, they were doing what they, they were doing. And so I think that for, for me, that was how I built relationships. And if I listened in, conver talk, in conversations or as they were coming in and passing periods, I really tried to listen what was coming up in their conversations. And I would on the fly adjust what I had planned for them based on maybe the scent, the stress I was sensing right? or where they, things that they had been struggling with. And so, and I would just, I, just like Wendy said, I would just talk to them. I would treat them like humans. Like if it seemed like, gosh, this was just not, something was off today. Um, I would acknowledge that with them mm -hmm. and say, you know what, something, something's going on. So something's off. Let's, let's try this again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. going to go home tonight and really think about yeah. what I need to do differently to make this go well tomorrow. And so I think for students that really made them feel like they were a part of the learning process. They weren't, they weren't this audience that was receiving, um, you know, some type of show. Mm -hmm. They were active in the process and I valued their input and their opinions and I adjusted accordingly. Right. They appreciate that. And even in the middle of a lesson, I've scrapped it. Oh, I mean, ab absolutely. Yep. <laughs> I oh, just yeah. all of a sudden go, this isn't, this isn't going to go where it needs to go. So, right. all right, we're going to go. And I, and I would always tell them too. I, it wasn't like a secret. Like everybody knew it was failing. <laughs> so I just scrapped it and was honest with them. And I think that builds trust. And obviously I'll, and when you have trust, you have connections. And, and, and um, you have to have a level of confidence as a teacher to do that. Right. Um, to just be honest with a group of kids. And, but the, the trust that it builds um, to be able to say, okay, hold on. This is, this is so not how I thought this was going to go today. Let me think about this for a minute. It was great but, in my head, not in yeah, my head. Yeah, right? And. And kids respect that. It doesn't take away your credibility or um, make them trust you less. It makes them trust you more. They're like, okay, this teacher has my best interest at heart. And uh, she realized or he realized this wasn't working. And so for teachers to do that is, is truly one of the most powerful things. Even to say, hold on, you guys, I, I, I can't, I couldn't remember what I was about to say. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're human then to them. And that is, is very important to, to model that. Well, and I think we want the best learning environments or environments where students um, aren't afraid to make mistakes. And one of the best things that we can do as teachers is openly admit and be okay with the fact that we messed up. Yeah. Uh, because it shows them, it models for them that it's okay. Like mm -hmm. I'm okay as the teacher admitting to you, this was not good. Um, and I think that then sets the tone in the classroom where we actually thrive on failure. Mm -hmm. That when we mess up, we are able to learn more. And when we can admit and acknowledge those mistakes, we can go even further. And so I think if you're doing that as the teacher, it becomes a much safer environment for students to do that themselves. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more with that. So I think, you know, we've answered, I think, my second question, which was, how do we model this? Well, we uh, we do this, you know, we did this as teachers, but I think we also do it at our trainings when we train teachers. Um, I think we're authentic with them. And, and when something doesn't go well or a slide isn't there or, you know, uh, the other day I didn't print 
I don't know, a really important page uh, for our handout. And I just owned it and said, I'm sorry, here's where else you could find it. We're going to move on. And here's um, the quick fix. Um, I just think that models the idea of like honesty and integrity. And I'm just, I'm a human. I'm developing these skills. We're all not perfect. If you guys could just hang in with me. Um, I do have great things to teach you today. I just, there was a little blip. Um, and so I think that helps a lot. Um, with all the things we're talking about with just making sure that we build trust and connect. Um, and I think we've talked a little bit now about how teachers can foster this in this classroom. So I'm going to kind of throw a curveball at both of you and they're going to look at me with huge eyes. Oh my gosh, they did. Look at them. Oh, I wish you could see them. Um, here's the thing. We've just talked a lot about how to build trust. But when trust is broken, let's say a teacher breaks the trust somehow it's extremely hard to get it back. So what would be your recommendations to our listeners who feel like, man, I screwed up. Like I didn't, I, I started the year off hardcore. Um, it's day 10 and I'm completely already burnt out. <laughs> and clearly I have lost these kids. How do we build that back up? Well, first of all, I don't think that that kind of trust is usually broken. Like if you mess up on a lesson or something and you just say, hey, I messed up. Most, most. No, no, no. Get but I'm talking it. like you just did but, not have a good start. They don't well, trust you. I, whatever. I remember <clears throat> not too many years ago, I snapped at some kids and I'm not, I'm not a yeller. I'm not usually a snapper. So I, I don't know what was going on that way, day. And then to make matters worse, not only did I snap at them, but I snapped at them for something they didn't actually do. Yes. Right. Yeah, and it's, it happens. We all have like high stress days. Right. So it, so you want to deal with it as immediately as possible. Like, don't go home and think about it and go to bed and wake up in the middle of the night. You know. So immediately, I was able to say to those two students, those two students in particular, I said, hey, can I talk to you just over here by my desk for a minute? And of course, they came back and they looked unhappy with me. And I just tumbled myself and said, I am so sorry that I snapped at you. And I realize now that you didn't um, do that. But even if you had, my reaction was not at all appropriate to you. I hope that you'll be able to accept my apology. And I hope that you'll give me a, a clean slate tomorrow, just like I try to give you a clean slate every day. And if there's something that I can do to um to make this up to you please let me know and you know i've i've done that several times in my career but when i've done that i have never had a student not respond kindly even those times when i've i've um overreacted to a student who did do something wrong when i've said you know <clears throat> i overreacted and i apologize i think i overreacted because you hurt my feelings. In fact, okay, I remember a specific time when uh, right in the middle of a class, a student went oh, really loudly. <laughs> like really long, loud, really, uh, well, really yawn. long yawn. And it uh, hurt my heart like like he was bored or something. Right. And, and, and I, I, you know, was a little snippy. And I, you know, I talked to him later and, and he he didn't really realize that what he was doing was rude or that it might affect me on a more personal level. Uh, but we talked it out and, and never had the issue again. So that's the important part is just to get it out there and to own up to your part in it. Even as the, the teacher, I'm just a human being. It doesn't matter if I'm five or 50 years older than you are. I'm just a human being. I will own up to my part of it. That's the most important. Yeah. And I think, um, going back to what you were talking about in the beginning, you started to describe what, what we often see. And I think what all of us did in our first uh, few years of teaching, as we were figuring out just what it means to build trust in a classroom, you get 10 days in and you realize like what you're, th there is, what you're doing isn't working. 
Um, but even after I think I had taught, it was probably my 11th or 12th year teaching. I had a group of students that they were, they were okay. They weren't nice to each other. Mm. Um, and it was, they, they kind of respected me. We kind of had that trust, but because they didn't like each other, they had issues going on between them as a group. It was just not a, um, a learning community. And so I feel like one of the ways that I, that I tried to address that, and, and I'll be honest, I never quite got there with that group. To this day, it's one of those experiences that just, it bothers me. I had a class like that too. Yeah. yeah, I just, I couldn't win them over. Um, but we would have, I would get to the point where maybe there was a day where I, it was just like, this is not, this isn't working. I've got to do something different. Like Wendy said, the answer is always humility. I literally started the next class with, guys, what can I do? I, I feel like I'm failing you. We're not, we're not having this, this positive, um, engaging learning environment because there's just this tension. Um, what can I do? And, you know, I had students who stepped up and they throw out ideas and every one of their ideas that was doable, they were freshmen. Um, (laughs) they're like, no lessons, snap time. You're like, no, okay, hold on. (laughs) Pause. Um, I need, I still need to teach you. Yes. So every, every idea that they had that was doable, I did, um, whether it fit my teaching style or not. This was what they thought might help. And if nothing else, even though I never got that class to truly build a community together, um, they ultimately respected me and what I was trying to do. And we had that trust. And for those um, who needed that, um, we achieved that. Um, And I think more kids learned in that class than would have had I not had those, those, those moments with them where I just admitted, this is just not working. Well, and it also reminds me a bit, you know, Julia saying, even if it didn't fit her personality or teaching style, um, we got, we got to get beyond that. So sometimes, you know, I, in my classes, in our classes uh, with adults, we make people dance, we make people um, use whole brain teaching. We, and they're like, oh, I couldn't do that with my class. That doesn't fit. I'm like, you've got to be willing to look a little foolish to win kids over. So uh, I don't have the greatest singing voice on the face of the earth, but boy, I can break into song and dance anytime in front of a group and did with my students all the time. And I, I made them sing with me. I made them move with me. It doesn't matter if it's like who I am at my core. If it's good for kids, I need to do it which is what Julia was saying with, with that difficult group of students. It might not have been her first choice on how to win them over, but she put uh, her needs aside for the good of the students. And that builds and restores trust. True. I, I also, I think a lot of teachers are going to hear this section and they're going to be like, oh, that seems awkward and risky. Like, I don't, Mm. you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, I remember the first time I had to um, critique students' papers in front of them. Their names are off of them. But I was like, am I doing, am I good enough to do this right now? Like, am I, I just had like imposter syndrome, like all of a sudden, like, can I, I, I grade papers all the time, but like doing it live in front of a studio audience is not the same. Like, and so I think. But once I did it and I saw the kids' reactions to me speaking honestly and vulnerably to them as a person that is a leader or a person of authority in the classroom, um, they were, and then watching them see like, oh, that's what I did wrong. Oh, I could see that in that paper. Oh, that makes more sense of what I didn't do correctly. Like I was so nervous. Like I was a sweaty mess, but like by the time it was over, I was like, oh, that was really impactful. So I think sometimes even though these opportunities to build trust and connections can feel super awkward and risky for us, especially if you're that teacher that isn't um, as comfortable with those things, it's something that will build up like your willingness to be vulnerable with kids but then that shows them that you also appreciate when they're vulnerable with you right and, and, so, and 
Another word I would add in there, Britt, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, you can't you interrupt use me the word time. vulnerable. I would use willing to take risks. Right. Because or just being authentic. Like Authentic. And and yeah. learning is about taking risks. It's, it is. it's putting yourself out there and saying, I don't know this yet, but I'm I'm ready and willing to learn. But if the teacher has the attitude, like I already know everything, or I'm not going to risk um, looking awkward or odd in front of you, students aren't going to risk looking awkward or Or odd either. They're not going to be as authentic back. Right. Exactly. This is exactly what I wanted to say. Like, because I was, I'm like, I'm sure they saw like me sweating. Like my palms were sweating as I was trying to do this. Um, But as I did it, and then I did it more, it became so much more natural and then part of my classroom culture. And therefore, right. we were connecting on different levels. Correct. Okay. So that kind of wraps up that um, concept. But let's go. And Julia pointed out to me that I said domain and not concept. So while we're talking about not doing things correctly, um, <laughs> I am by far the um i'm just personifying you know what we're trying to i just wanted to make sure everybody knew that i was okay and humble enough to uh, own up to my mistake so the next concept is learning environment and obviously this is concept three in the framework and uh, environment in general is a passion of mine learning environment but we're talking not only about um where you put your stuff and how you decorate or whatever but we're also talking about um the design based on how, what are the academic, social, and emotional needs of the kids. So our current position in structural specialists, like we walk through classrooms often. Um, we're very fortunate to see amazing environments, okay? But we also see environments that are concerning, okay? And I want you guys, and I want us all three to talk about this, but you know, what are the main differences when we walk into a classroom where we can see amazing learning environment and when we're talking about that it's not about it being cute and pretty right it's about that academic and social emotional well-being the kids are engaged what are the things we're seeing when it's amazing and what are the things we're seeing when it's concerning well i think first we can define the difference between um if if you want to make the clear quick distinction between an amazing classroom environment and a classroom environment that could use some some adjustments is the difference between a student-centered learning environment and a teacher-centered learning environment. Amen. Um, so a, I like it when you say amen. I know. Uh, <laughs> Hallelujah. I know. So yeah, you know, a student-centered learning environment, um, first of all, you see that there's no clear, distinct place where the teacher always stands. Like you walk into an, envir- an environment, um, if, if you can see, oh, I know, I know where the teacher spends the majority of their time, um, you have a teacher-centered environment. Um, when you walk into a classroom and you can't really tell where the teacher's quote-unquote space is, that's an indicator that you are that you have probably most likely a student-centered environment. Um, when you look at the walls. If you see those uh, cat posters <laughs> hanging in there. <laughs> oh, please take um, it down if you still have that up in your classroom. I beg you. Yeah. Hey, that um, class is full in our learner's market coming up. My oh, uh, design good. class. So, yay. They'll know. I have the cat poster on a slide saying, please don't do this anymore to kids. Right. Hang right. in there. Well, and, and even the movie posters and yes. or, or the teacher just loves... I don't football know. or whatever. Yeah. football or flowers yeah. or um Oregon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wendy loves Oregon for all the I listeners do. that don't and, know. And Julia loves flowers. Uh-huh. And Julia loves flowers. I guess I don't really have a love. I love Oregon and flowers now too. They've converted inverted me to both. So. <laughs> right. So I think when you look at the walls in the classroom and the walls are a place to see immediately what they're learning, what they've learned, what they're doing, why they're doing it. Um, you can actually see a process of the learning occurring um, on the on the walls. Whether you're looking at anchor charts, you're looking at student work. Um, those are indicators that you have this student centered environment. That the learning is the center of how the the physical environment is created, um, not the teacher's preferences or interests. And this is hard for us because we live in our classrooms. Right. Those are our spaces, and it is really hard not to want to um, decorate them to our taste. 
Um, but really, when we talk about you know a a learning environment where we're we're talking about academic, social, and emotional well being of students, student centered environments are the are the first place to look. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, especially. Um with like less is more like I'd always want to fill every single space of the walls <laughs> because I love to decorate and I can't decorate my house anymore so of course I want to decorate more things so I was like oh I'll just decorate my classroom and what I learned quickly it was like leave as much space open and like just put up the posters actually they were posters I made and I just blew up at Staples that I knew I would reference all year mm-hmm. for student right. learning Right. Everything I, I, else was just empty, you know? And actually, I think that helped other kids, too, that, like, really can't deal with that high stimulation of a lot of things. Like, it just, it clutters their mind, too. So, I think less is more sometimes when we think of our learning environment in that way. Uh, but let's also talk about it in terms of, like, design, like, um, and connecting with the concerning areas. So, like, Wendy... I love you, but you walk through a lot of rooms. I do. A lot, a lot, a lot of rooms. A lot, than, a lot, a lot. Of. A lot, a lot. A lot, a lot. Of, more than Julia and I have probably in our careers. Right. And, What's, and what concerns you immediately? Right. So uh, actually, I wasn't even going to jump in because, you know, I agree with Julia so much. I shouted out amen and hallelujah. <laughs> well, and I agree with her too, but I right. know you have a no, couple things. So, so it's, it, it really is about who's doing what in the classroom. So when I go in to, to observe a teacher, go through a walkthrough, I'm really watching the kids and, and not the teacher. How do the students feel in the environment? Is this a place where um, students, as we talked about earlier, are willing to take risks? Is this a place where students feel that they are valued? Is this a place where students feel that they um, belong? All of those things are part of the environment. So when I watch students, are they in fact, as we just talked about, are they in fact taking risks? Are they in fact um, willing to be their authentic selves? And and how the, the teacher creates that environment uh, isn't uh, about what posters are up or what um, what you have personally up. That, it, although I think those are important, um, this is about how you are welcoming them and how you are um, seating them. One of the things that always concerns me is when I walk in a classroom and students are sitting in rows. Um, and obviously we're... Uh, you know, still in the pandemic and all of that. But if if you already have 30 students in a room, you may as well put them together. <laughs> and that is that, that environment. Luck with your six feet apart, yeah. Right, uh-huh. the environment that we are here and working together for a common goal. learning. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so Julia has like this golden four question thing that I feel like most teachers would love to know. And I want the listeners to know it too, because if anyone told me this in a training, it may would make me go, huh? Like, do I achieve these things as a, as a teacher? I felt like I was a pretty good teacher, but whenever she would say it to uh, teachers in our trainings, I would reflect back as a teacher and think, I don't know if I would have re- met those standards, but I think they're good when we talk about learning environment. Uh, uh, Julia, do you have them with you? Yeah. So, so I think <clears throat> this is, t- these are typically questions that we have teachers ask themselves, um, or, or visualize when we're talking about how they design instruction and communicate with students. But I do think it has a place when we're talking about learning environment. Um, so I'm going to adjust the questions just a little bit. And, um, by all means, I'm pretty sure these aren't my questions. Um, no, they're, they're actually they're in out. lots of places, but yeah, Julia I just is... call them Julia's questions. Right. Because she's really... <laughs> She's really good at getting them out there. She is. <laughs> so when I walk into a classroom, if I'm talking about learning environment, um, it should be very clear. Um, and the students themselves should be able to answer this. Um, and the walls should answer this. The walls should all personify. Um, the hallway the could answer this. Yeah. What are you doing? Like, it should be really clear um, on the walls um, in the classroom or in the how, how the classroom's set up, how they're grouped. Um, what are you doing? And, and kids should be able to answer that. 
Um, the next most important question is why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? And so the learning environment should clearly indicate that in some way, shape, or form um, with where they're going. Like what, yeah, like what, learning goals, learning, success yes, criteria. Learning, yeah. So yep. those things should be, those things should be clear and students should know them and they should be able to reference them. They should be somewhere. Um, and then the next question is, how are you going to know when you get it? How are you going to know when you get it? So can I look around the room and see something that indicates, like you said, Britt, success criteria? Yeah. Or some type of product that they could say, that's what I'm shooting for. So they need it. They need targets, right? Right. And then how's the teacher going to know when you get it? Is, is the final piece. So I, really it's about the walls personifying the answers to those questions. Yeah, um, and the so students being able to articulate back to you. Yeah, so the students- If the walls have it and they don't notice. <laughs> right, right. Right? So work that's up, the learning goals and the success criteria that are up, um, the anchor charts that the teachers provided, the things that the teacher references regu regularly for the students, um, all of those things personify the answers to those questions. Yeah. And I, and just having them, I mean, it took me a long time as a teacher, we would have them um, make a poster that represented their performance task for the end of a unit. And I would have like the winning poster of the groups up um, for the whole unit. And so it took me a long time to like make this part of my teaching day, I guess, but I would consistently walk over that poster and reference, okay, here's the part of this performance task that we're working on right now. I mean, and so they were all able to go whoosh and look at that poster. So just they had, they had knowledge of where they were going. They knew I had knowledge of where we were going. It wasn't just like random lessons. And I think that is what creates a connecting community of learners with their teacher instead of just Hi, I'm the teacher. I know what I'm doing. Sit, listen, and enjoy. Um, <laughs> so, all right. Finally, wrapping up Connect um, is concept four, which is family and community engagement. And I don't know about you guys, but this is not my strength. And I found cons it was hard cons consistency, consistently. Sorry, I'm not feeling well. Uh, connecting with families to be challenging as a high school teacher, like, I don't know. Like there wasn't like the, like elementary, I feel like they see the parents more because there's more parent teacher conferences happening. Um, and then all of a sudden they go to high school and you don't even have people show up for meet the teacher night. It's like the weirdest transition. And so I just had like a hard time connecting as a high school teacher. And looking back, I wish I had done more. I don't know where I would have fit it. I don't know how I would have done it, but I wish I would have done more. How about you ladies? Where, where are you at on that? Well, I I like to think of this as a strength of mine. It is. And my, my evidence of that is the number of parents of former students I have as Facebook friends. Um, <laughs> and um and it's true though. That, that right, that tell I have lots of former students who are grown adults now as Facebook friends, but I have their parents too. Yeah. That that tells me something. Right. And so you know, when we talk about engaging the community, that doesn't mean that I have to go down to the farmer's market and go, hey, how are you today? The community starts with the families of your students, whether it's their parents or if they're being raised by grandparents or aunts and uncles, all of that. And one of the things that I used to do, and I find it's a helpful little trick in many areas of my life, if I had to call a parent because a student was misbehaving or because they uh, had missing assignments or something like that, I would always begin with, hi, this is Miss Peterson, Johnny's teacher. Um, I'm so hoping that you can help me. And immediately that, amen. right? Oh, now oh. I got an amen. Now give me a hell of a ring. Yeah. Now I'm going right? to need to throw an amen in, which is so right? uncharacteristic Because for that, me. that immediately, if I started with, you know what? I'm really tired of how Johnny enters my classroom. <laughs> or um, yeah, Susan that's not going to go well. get her work done. What are you doing at home that she's not getting her work done? Never, ever, ever works. So that, how can you help me? Or I'm hoping that we can work together on this. I also think it's extremely important to assure parents, authentically ensure parents, that you have their child's best yeah. interest at heart mm -hmm. and that every decision that you make 
will be for the good of their child. Um, and Britt, you may end up cutting this out, but this is just a little pet peeve of mine, is when we call, when we say to parents, your student is missing work. It's not their student. That, that is my student. It's no, I like their that. child. It's their child, yeah. And it's really important. And I don't care if that child is a senior. That right. is still their child. I'm 57. I'm still my mother's child. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that it is also helpful in um, making those relationships stronger. I also want to add on, on the larger community or family and community engagement, um, we need to look at data and we need to see what subgroups uh, in our classrooms and on our campuses are, are feeling uh, disengaged. And that happens a lot at junior high and high school. And so when we can locate those subgroups, I think we need to figure out what is going to bring them in. Um, so we know that sometimes families who are um, maybe not as educated or don't speak English as well, or and, and there are myriad other social economic social issues, economic yeah. issues. Mm -hmm. they're not always comfortable with the school environment. For some families, school was not a happy place for them. Yeah. So they, they don't want to engage there. So many years ago, when I was in Mesa, we started a night um, for of families who were Hispanic and any anybody was invited and they were allowed to bring children, little children. So often we exclude little children, which excludes parents who can't get a babysitter or don't have somebody to watch. And we spent um, our own money, um, although PTO helped, and we did a, a, a dinner come have dinner with us. We didn't do a big program. We didn't do anything like that. It was, we're here. Let's meet our principal and our assistant principal. Let's meet the teachers who are here. Let's visit. And primarily, and, and this, this is my golden advice, primarily our focus was we are here to serve you. I know that this is kind of a popular concept right now. We must have a service mentality toward our students, toward their parents, toward the neighborhood and to the community at large. Um, having a servant heart um, adds that humility that I talked about a minute ago. And so when these families would come to our school and we would serve them food that we had made, that we would, um, it, hold a crying baby so that a parent could have a bite to eat. This showed them that we were with them, right. not apart from them, but mm -hmm. with them and working together. Right. Part of the larger, the larger community. Correct. Um, so as a mom, I love getting her newsletters from school. Um, I never sent a single newsletter out as a high school teacher. You know, that's funny because I was going to jump in um, earlier when we were talking about, like, specifically in the classroom, what do you do for that family and community engagement? Um, and Wendy, I love I love what you say about it, engaging and connecting with the community um, and really having that service mentality. So I was really bad at newsletters, um, but it was something I was passionate about. So um, I could not figure out how to organize myself to get them sent every month. No shock there. Um, but uh, but I really I really wanted the parents to know what what What's their children happening? were doing. Um, yeah. And I'm with you, Wendy, on the pet peeve. Um, they when we talk to parents, we need to talk to them about their child, um, not about not not to them about their student. Um, but so when I did my national board certification, this was something I had to really dig into. Um, and make sure that I was doing. And I can tell you when I had that dedication to sending those newsletters, um, I had so much more parent support in what was going on. And yes, um, will there potentially be people that are like, I, I really don't care what you're doing in English right. or what you're doing in science? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Sure. Um, but I think a lot of parents, especially when we're talking about adolescents, feel so disconnected yeah, yes. to their kids and how, how great 
how great is it to know that like, hey, you were talking about this war in social studies this, you know, these last couple of weeks. And when we sit down to dinner, I can bring that up. Um, yeah. it, it gives us, it gives, as a parent, it gives, it would give them talking points. And so, um, so I would really encourage teachers to think about that. Think about that, at least monthly communication to mm -hmm. parents that's not about something their their child has done wrong. <laughs> right. And I think we go to um, how valuable those little notes are or those little phone yeah. calls home. I remember the first time I called home um, to tell a parent something great that their child had oh, done. And yeah. just the shock. They're like, right. oh, thank you so much what? for calling and telling me that. That uh -huh. means so much to me. Uh -huh. I, I, I hung up the phone the first time I did it and thought, oh my goodness, why don't I do this more often? Feels that filled up my cup. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, it makes the, Fills the, up the your parent cup. feel good. And I wanna, I wanna go back and touch on one other thing that came up, which is when we do call home and we are gonna have a difficult conversation with parents, um, we absolutely cannot call parents to just tell them their kid is failing. We cannot oh, just no. call parents to tell them they're missing all these assignments. Just as Wendy said, that opening, the opening of that phone call is going to make or break the success of the whole point that you're calling home. And that is, you know, that I want to work together with you to help Johnny or Susie or whoever, um, be successful in my class. And I remember, you know, one example of this is if I called home and Johnny had been missing, um, you know, pretty much most of the assignments and we were coming up on that, that final performance task, you know, I, I would call home with the intent of saying, I don't really care if Johnny gets these assignments in. Right. Yeah. What I care about is that Johnny's learning. And I right. think is he, he mastering is. the skill. Yeah. Yes. And I would tell the parents, I think he is. But if he does not turn in this final Anything. thing, yes, yeah. to show me that he's learning, I, I can't, I can't 100% say he can do it. And so, so I don't want him to focus on all the little things in the grade book right now. I'll, I can go back and fix those. I want him to focus on showing me what he knows. Can you help me do that? Mm -hmm. And when you have those conversations with parents, it's not a, hey, just let you know, they didn't turn everything in, so they're going to fail. It is no. I, I'm letting you know that that I think I think he can do this. I know he can do this. Can you help me? Have him show me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that becomes such a more valuable conversation when the parent goes and talks to the, their child and tells them that um, the tr the trust that that family um, engagement you've made it a, every everybody's a partner in this and the kid really feels valued and believed in and they don't feel like they're in a hole they can't get out of. Well, and so I, I definitely want to comment on that. Um, so many times we get caught up in, you know, they haven't done these 20 assignments. Well, if you're not calling until the 20th assignment, that's one problem. <laughs> um, that's, a, you know, and, and then you're irritated with the kid. There, there's just no way. And then when Julia was talking about, I need to see what you know, um, I, when she said, I can adjust the grade book, um, newsflash, we can adjust <laughs> the grade book. Uh -huh. And if the student is showing us mastery, that's what we want. Not whether these 10 point points of piece assignments are in the grade book. Um, and I, I also I'm kind of making notes to myself here as, as we talk and I think about things, um, you mentioned, Britt, that parents don't, especially at the high school level, don't always come to an open house or a curriculum. Yeah, a well, especially the older the kids get. It's like the, the freshman older, people are there. The old, for sure. <laughs> you know, part of why I think that is, is huh. because every year they go, they think, why did I come tonight? Why <laughs> did I need to be here tonight? By the time right. they get that in high school, they're like, there is nothing this teacher can tell me that I haven't heard since kindergarten. Right. So I would like to send out a challenge to teachers, um, all levels, K-12, all the way up, that you stop having curriculum nights, open houses, all of that where you go through what you already sent them at the beginning of the year, your tardy policy, your grading amen. policy, uh, what you're I got my amen in. Study. <laughs> Stop. So uh, one of the classes, one of the classes I teach is about um, using a public narrative. And 
I started doing this in my my classroom when parents would come and everybody else's classroom, they would have heard, you know, all those things we just talked about, the late policy and the tardy right. policy and dress you know, code because what yay. we're reading and dress code and all of that. <laughs> I began telling them a story from my life about um, former students or about why I became a teacher or something like that. And then the public narrative takes that personal story and turns it into how are we going to work on this together in a way that will benefit you and your child. And so it became more of a connection than don't forget students need to turn in their assignments. Mm -hmm. Who wants to come hear that? Who oh, wants no. to come uh, know about your labor policy? And so I think if teachers would become more storytellers yeah, and yeah. work more on using those nights when we do invite parents to come to our campus as to a way to connect, yeah. then we would see more parents coming to junior high and high school open house because they want to see who they want to know who's teaching their children. Mm -hmm. They just don't really care what your late work policy is. You yeah, they want to know who writing. is teaching them, like you personally. Yeah. Right. Right? Like they and, know and you're that, a teacher. <laughs> right. And that was my night, too, where I reassured the parents who were there that I would take care of their children as if they were my own. And as a parent and grandparent myself, that's what I want to know from a teacher. Yeah, Are you too, going too. to love my child? Are you going to take care of my child? Everything else we can work through. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, right? I'm at a loss for words, which again, that's. That doesn't happen I very know. often. <laughs> well, I think uh, we've given yeah. some ideas for teachers that they can use with their families to connect. I mean, we've talked about newsletters. We've talked about open house night and how to kind of flip that on its head a little bit and make you know, parents feel more um, welcome and connect with us. And we've talked about calls home, right? How to make those things happen in a more positive way. And even I think I remember being a teacher, like, I don't have time to call home to all the kids that are doing well. I just don't. I just don't have time. But like Julia said, when she got off the phone, it was like, why don't I do this more? Like, it actually makes my feel really good. And I just made that parent feel really good. And it wasn't probably that long of a conversation. And it had, and it was impacting the whole relationship in your whole day as a teacher. And as teachers, as we get more tired and burnt out, we need things to fill our cups up like that. Well, and, and it doesn't, it can be a, an email too. You know, true. About, mm -hmm. you know, when we see sometimes as teachers, see a parent email pop up, mm -hmm. we have that moment of panic. Like, <gasps> yeah. What did I do? What, you know, is this yeah. going to be? And one of the things is we can set a different tone. If we're set, if we're dropping, like if, if I leave on a Thursday and the last thing I do is send two quick emails about two students and hmm. just really specifically something great that I'm seeing them doing, um, I guarantee you we start our Friday off with a really fun, happy email mm -hmm. back from the parent. Right. And so so we can change sometimes the tone of, of the emails that come in just in, in the in the the proactive ones that we send. Right. Well, and and sometimes doing an email is even better than a, a, a phone call because then it's writing and we can print it out and show grandma and grandpa and all of that. Mm -hmm. Especially to, if there's pictures attached of their work right? or something. Mm -hmm. And to also add to what Julia is talking about here, um, at the very beginning of the year, so think about this for the beginning of second quarter or second semester, I could pretty quickly pick out who might cause a problem for me either, either behaviorally or who might struggle academically. Those were the first kids where I emailed or called their parents because then I'd already had a positive interaction with them before I had to call to say, um, you know, Susie's behavior in class is disruptive or, um, you know, Janie didn't get her work done. I had already talked to the parent or emailed the parent saying how thrilled I was to be Susie's teacher. Yep. Especially if you know they're nervous about something like a test or a quiz or a presentation mm -hmm. coming up. They've already reached out to you or the kid has reached out to you that I'm super nervous. And then you email or call or whatever the parent and just be like, they rocked it. Okay. I know right. they were super nervous, but yep. she rocked it or mm -hmm. he rocked it. Um, right. It just shows that you're connecting and trying to care. And I and I think ultimately 
that's the this is the goal of our first domain here is connect. Right. I mean, that's Absolutely. why it is the first one. Can I also throw in that um, we need to remember if we notice that a kid is struggling, yes. or if we know that, that has nothing to do with our class, but we notice that they seem somewhat anxious or they seem upset or they they're seem all of a sudden something. their hoods up for no reason. Yeah, they're just something's uh, just different. I, I also think we need to remember that those those emails or those phone calls home are just as valuable to, to parents because it shows, just as Wendy said, it shows that we are watching these kids just as, as though they are our babies, yeah. Yeah. That, that we are paying attention and we know that we see them sometimes more than, than the parents do. And, and talk about building that family and community engagement in, in these learners, these kids that are in our classroom, um, really indicating to parents that we, we also notice when they seem off. Mm -hmm. Yep, perfect. So that wraps up all the different concepts in the Connect domain. We've kind of touched on each single one. Um, and so I'm going to put them through some rapid fire questions because- Oh, my word. <laughs> okay. All right, and and <laughs> I know you love it. So Just uh, remember, paybacks, Britt. Paybacks. You're sure in office. I, I know, but I won't be there for a while. So <laughs> okay. all right. <laughs> and I'm bringing you gifts when I come back, so be nice. Oh, okay. All well, right. go ahead. Fire away. All right, here we go. Number one, connecting in a school environment looks like Wendy Go. A dandelion, um, <laughs> with. <laughs> Wait, wait, why are we laughing? No, I just was not expecting that. But yes, you are the metaphor person. You go, you go, girl. Because, because, because all the, you, you know, blow on that and all those little seeds go taking off in all different directions and grow more plants. And we know that dandelions might be just a weed. But they're really, really beneficial. You know, you know, bees depend. Anyway, I, I, I do love metaphors. So, um, if you wanted me to be literal, I could, but that is no, not that was perfect. Fun. I just wasn't ready. <laughs> not as much fun as thinking of a dandelion seeds going just everywhere floating everywhere in, because then you're connecting with everyone. Yeah, in perpetuity, I get it. They go on forever and ever and ever. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you, and I love that. Okay, Julia. Yeah. <laughs> Same one. <laughs> Same one. You follow up the dandelion. Go. Well, I don't know. I'm going to be more literal. So connecting in a school environment looks like happy risk taking. Oh, I like that. So, you know, you, you can see that the kids are taking risks, big risks, but they're really happy about it. There's, they're, they're, yes, they're excited to take these risks and we don't see any, we don't see any real anxiety or fear. Um, and so to me, that's what connecting in that school environment looks like. So for me, I wrote down, it looks like students finding their joy. Okay, it is not rapid fire if you know the questions and you get to write down the answer. Oh, please. Oh, no. <laughs> it's my podcast. I can do what I want to. Oh. <laughs> uh -huh. It's my party. Oh, people are going to laugh. Okay. Number two, then. Fine. You rapid go question. First this time, Julia. All right. Yes, Julia, you get to go first. As a mother, and then Wendy as a grandparent, what does being included in the school community look like to you? So, what, okay. Because, <laughs> I mean, it, as I a mom, it, it's different. I say it over and over again, and I say it with my own, with, with my daughter in school and now with my son in preschool. Um, it it means that commun being communicated with. Yeah. Being included in what's going on, what's happening. When I know what's happening, I feel like I'm with it. I know I, I'm part of that school's environment. When a teacher doesn't communicate with me or the school doesn't communicate with me and I'm just left hanging to only evaluate what's going on by whatever comes home, <laughs> um, then I don't then I don't feel like I'm part of that that community. So and and the other piece of it is that being including included in the school community is also about um, it's not about all the the don'ts. It's, it, it's about the, it's, it's so but not about the don't do this or the no's. It's really about like what you can do. Like what, here's what you can do to be part of our community. Here's what you can do as a parent. Um, so, so that, that's what that would be for me. Okay. And, and for me uh, in grandparent mode now, 
Uh, but thinking back to... Um, well, you can think back to your boy. I, I, thought, think grand, I thought grandparent might be yeah. more prevalent. With well, him. it is the most important role that I play right now. So, uh, but really what... My mom says it's her favorite. Oh, it's the best. It's Which I feel like is the best. But whatever. <laughs> well, so I think it's important. And, and Julia just, you know, mentioned this too, that I'm part of the team. I'm part of my children back in the day and now my granddaughters i'm part of their learning and growing i provide um a lot of value to what they're doing and so even something as simple as if if i go to a school campus that i'm welcomed like oh you're so and so's grandma it's so nice to meet you um that that makes such a big difference. It seems yeah. little, but it makes such a big difference. And um, and again, just that I'm valued, that, that um, it's acknowledged that these children in our classrooms aren't separate entities. They have right. parents, siblings, aunts and uncles, grandparents, what, whatever it happens to be, and that I am part of that. Yeah. And I just like the enthusiasm. If I drop off my kid and like the teacher's like, hey, how you doing? You know, today we're going to do it. And I just feel like I'm, I'm dropping them off at a positive place that, and I think that goes, you know, if you get like a pit in your stomach when you drop your child off, like, oh, gosh, I, that's I not good. They, no, you know, so I, I, it's just one of those things I think that we got to think about when we're connecting with kids, you know, it, there are days where. I did not want to smile or be enthusiastic. I was having a day, um, but I turned that puppy on um, and I was smiley and happy and just was like, you know, and actually eventually throughout the class period, I got there because I actually am happy to be there. It's just, I got to get over whatever it was that I was upset about earlier. But sometimes I feel like teachers, we have to fake it for the good of the kids. I know that sounds horrible, but. That's a whole nother podcast, Britt. So that, that'll be our next so one. That's very important our too. next one's designed. So we'll get there. All right. Number three, if you could pass on any wisdom to teachers about connecting with students, um, and it doesn't have to be just with students. If you guys want to go colleagues, staff too, because we talked a lot about students and community, but if you want to go colleagues and staff, what would you say? just humble yourself. Oh, I mean, okay. that's humility. Mm -hmm. um, some, when we talk about PLCs and teachers getting together um, and talking about what works and what doesn't, um, we have to, as teachers, we have to be humble. We have not just with our students when we make mistakes, but with our colleagues when we make mistakes. We have to admit, like, the way you taught that was much better than what I did. And that's hard. It that's is really hard. hard. Um, and so, but, but that really is, I think that is, that is a piece of wisdom. That is a skill, um, that, that we have to have in order to really be the best educators that we can be. Okay. Yeah. I used to see Julia teach something and then run down the hall and tell my kids, okay, I taught that wrong. So we're going to tee it like how Julia did. <laughs> um, and they would laugh just like that. I'd erase my board. I'd reteach it. And they go, yeah, that makes more sense. I'm like, it makes more sense to me too. Let's go. And it was, it's just, it is what it is. And I, you just have to be humble. I, I love, I love that answer. What do you think, Wendy? So, uh, you know, Anybody who knows me, and if you're listening and you don't know me, I'm 57. This is my, I don't know, 35th or 36th year in education. So I'm just going to lay it out there. I'm just going to say it how it is. I totally agree with Julia on the humidity. Humidity. <laughs> <laughs> it is humid for, right now. For, for Arizona, it's kind of humid today. Humility. Uh -huh. um, but I want, and I don't mean this in any way to be trite or cliched, it's about love. Yeah. It is absolutely about um, loving your students, showing them love. How we do that, it looks right. different depending right. on our personality, but you have to have love in your heart for your students, for your colleagues, for their mm -hmm. families. And, and not every student is easy to love. Not every parent is easy to love. 
so one of the things I do is not every colleague is easy to not love. Not every colleague. I wasn't. I love you that, both. That's not, that wasn't like a jab. I was just saying. Right. <laughs> For- I in my <laughs> mind when I'm feeling that kind of like you know I don't I don't like you or I don't want to like you or you irritate me. I really really try to first humble myself and then in my mind I just say over and over love 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 love. Yeah. And that for me encompasses everything. Mm-hmm. And so again, it, it might sound kumbaya-ish, but I can't say anything other than love. You've got to have love in your heart. If you don't have love in your heart, then you should do like bill collecting or something. Even then, I think you should have love in your heart. But um, if, if you're you talking have... and connecting with people all day long, that's your job. Right. You, you right. got to have some level of humility and love. And otherwise, love. you're going to shrivel up. And it, that's right. what happens. And I think that's why teachers struggle for sure. And you won't see the effects in yeah. learning. Yeah. So it, have... it is connected. It is not separate. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, number four, what is your go-to when you are feeling disconnected? So we're talking about connection, but if you feel disconnected, how do you get yourself back online? Um, for me, it's not what, it's who. Okay. Um, and I go Change to... Change my question. It's fine. Uh, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> you're Sorry. Um, I thought for I, sure you're going to be saying crochet, but it's fine. I, I will say that when I, am, when I am discombobulated and I am feeling disconnected, um, I my go-to person is one of you two ladies. Oh. I, I spend so much of my day with both of you. We, mm, yeah. we live together in an office. We do. Um, and so my my go-to really is I, I need to help. I need both of your I need both of your help understanding why. Yeah. I, and 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 it becomes one of those I have to, I have to get to that point where I kind of humble myself and admit like I'm I might be doing something wrong. That's really hard for me. It's really um, hard for everyone. And, mm-hmm. and, and then he try and hear from you, like, what, what, what am I doing? What's going wrong? Yeah. And that comes back to our last question, right? Like those PLCs, like we are kind of like a little mini PLC in our office. We are. We yeah. are a oh, PLC, I, officially so, and unofficially. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, I can look at Wendy at any time and be like, I'm not making sense. Words are coming out please make this make sense because and she'll wordsmith it for me. Um, You know, so just that humility, I think um, for that we get to have is really special. Um, And I wish that on every teacher's Mm -hmm. community PLC. I, I, if that could happen, oh man, the progress and the impact on kids would be huge. What do you think, Wendy? What's your go-to when you're feeling disconnected? Well, um, and, and I'm at a place in my life, I, I say this to you two ladies all the time, I don't have little kids at home, um, I, I don't have a, a spouse, and so I, I rest, and, and you two with little ones and spouses don't always have that opportunity, but rest doesn't necessarily mean going into your room, closing the door, and sleeping for days, right. although I do that. <laughs> rest, rest might be five minutes of, I need to go use the restroom, please don't bother me, go in the restroom, lock the door and just sit. It Take might mean, it might mean um, at your lunch or when students are at specials or it's your prep period, putting your head down on your desk for 15 minutes. There mm-hmm. is nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, and, and then going back to what seems to become a theme today, if I'm feeling disconnected, I also need to look inward to figure out what part I have played in it. Um, and, and, and you two help me figure that out sometimes. And, and it's painful, which then goes back to the humility. Um, but taking care of ourselves, reflecting all of that, will help me reconnect. Yeah, I agree with both of that. And for I, I know these are supposed to be rapid fire questions for you, but yeah. when I feel disconnected, <laughs> I'm not at the office and I feel disconnected. Um, so when I feel disconnected or I feel off and I have to come back online, I ask questions. Like I ask like the hard questions. And I think 
even though I'm not really sure how I'm going to take the answer, you know, I, I, I always am like, I'll ask one of you, like, this is how I felt in this moment. Where was I at? And you guys will honestly say, well, no, that's this, or this, this, this. And I, I can, I can then try to figure out, okay, this is a, this is a me thing, or this is a, you know what I mean? And I think that helps too. Yeah. Um, Cause that brings me back online to the group. I think sometimes when I can just be honest with you guys about how I'm feeling. Yeah. All right. And then I wrote this question just for you, ladies, just Please. for you, because I know you need it in your life. So what is the one thing you could eat and never get sick of? Okay. There is not one thing. That, that is the problem. <laughs> okay. There is not one thing. So um, as you both saw me eating crab in Oregon. Oh, summer, yes. I could eat yes. crab all the time and never get sick of it. Same with lobster, same with shrimp chocolate for sure and finally ice cream if okay i, I said could, one thing wendy peterson okay sorry <laughs> if i could, if i could eat ice cream breakfast lunch and dinner i okay. would and there All are right. times going back to the how do you get reconnected there are times <laughs> when i've had breakfast lunch and dinner of ice cream okay so i too cannot do just one thing but <laughs> all sweet scones okay i yes. love scones oh meringues. man we searched for a good scone when we yeah, were in oregon yeah trader yeah. joe's meringues um brit has watched um the <laughs> mess that comes from eating the entire bin um of meringues especially when we're working on a project right yep. then, hey um fuel Anything, can anything sugar, cotton candy, um, Smarties, bottle caps, bring it on. I love it. I love sugar. it. And if you replaced eat with drink for both of these ladies, it would be coffee. Oh, oh yes. And thank yeah. goodness, um, Wendy. Actually, I have my coffee. I've been drinking it as I've been of course. interviewing. Of course. Um, okay. So, all right. Has uh, season three progresses. Okay. Um, and it's going to probably roll into season four because we're not going to get through all the uh, major domains. Um, now I'm checking my words. I'm all, I'm all like self-conscious between the concepts and domains. Uh, we're not going to get through all the domains in season three because season three ends at semester. So um, as we discuss the remaining parts of the instructional framework as a team, which by the way, I think this is really fun. I like doing this with you guys, but um, here's what they are. So listeners, as you're listening to this, they are going to be design, instruct, assess, and reflect. So if you enjoyed this conversation, uh, it's a very candid conversation. Obviously, it's surrounding what we're doing as a district, but we also wanted to pull in how we taught when we were teachers, but also how we teach now. Uh, please look out for those episodes because I am going to put those words in the episode titles in uppercase letters. So if you are listening to this and you want to listen to it as a series, look for those titles as they come up. Any final thoughts, ladies, on making connections in a learning community just to send people off? Any final things? Not really, other than I love you too. Thank you for being part of my community. Oh. Oh, I know. Well, how, how, how am I supposed to top that? I don't know. know. Julia almost made me cry a minute ago oh. when she was talking <laughs> yeah. about needing us. So we should probably just end it right now and go meet somewhere for a scone and a cup of coffee. That's how we will connect. If only we could, right? right. All right. Well, thank you nice. ladies for coming on and helping listeners understand, obviously, the importance of having an instructional model in your district. If you don't have one, the importance of instruction right? It being really the, the main focus of what we do, we get distracted so easily by so many other things. Um, and that's unfortunate, but really what we're here to do is instruct kids, connect with kids. And, and I love the, make them your own, make them feel safe. Um, and I'm glad that we were able to share some stories. Um, and also just show the audience how it is, it is important to be honest and open and vulnerable, uh, because we can learn a lot from each other that way. And it's the same with you and your students. So thank you guys so much for coming on today. You're thank welcome. You. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Learning Unlocked and finding out more about Connect, making connections in your community. Um, your school community is important. It is what makes or breaks um, a teacher. And I think talking about that um, is really important. Um, and I enjoyed um, 
even though I am far away uh, at my house, I enjoyed seeing my colleagues and talking about this with them. Uh, it's it was a pleasure, and I hope I hope you also enjoyed that ride. Um, so if you've listened today as a GPS educator, you can receive PD recertification credit. You just need to visit our employee hub page that is under professional growth, and um, you just want to click on the button that says digital PD courses. Just a reminder that we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at GPS Prof Growth. That's G P S P R O F G R O. W-T-H. For more information or resources from this episode, please visit our website at learningunlocked.lipson.com forward slash website. We are distributed by Lipson to Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and Audible. Episodes are also available on our PGD YouTube channel under playlists. Our intro and outro music are licensed from Plumality Loops. Um, if you do have time to go into Apple Podcasts and give us a rating, that would be awesome. The more teachers uh, that see our podcast, uh, the more uh, we get to reach out and empower other educators. Uh, and so by writing a review, it actually just makes our podcast uh, uh, more available to um, teachers that could listen to it. So we would appreciate that. Thanks again, key holders. Just keep unlocking curiosity, creativity, and innovation with your students. Stay kind and courageous. Keep making those connections. And I'll see you next time.